and we're ready to start the meeting, Ms. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, as development officer, I'll call the meeting to order and ask the MPC members present to select a chair for today's meeting. I'll nominate uh, Lynn. Okay, uh, call a second time for any nominations for chair today. Hearing none, I'll call a third time for any nominations for chair today. And hearing none, uh, Lynn, you can assume the chair. Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, so I'm gonna start with some opening remarks. Uh, the MPC virtual meetings have been experiencing some conductivity problems that cause distortions of loss of video or audio. Um, we ask the participants leave the meeting briefly and log back in. But if there are no major problems, we have successfully completed the agenda. It is important that we consider all discussion points and verbal information in order to make the best possible decisions. And it may take some time in this format to ensure all comments are heard and understood. I ask all participants to be patient as we work through any technology interruptions we experience, but things are looking good so far this morning. Participants in today's meetings are counselors Paul Clark and Paul Ryan, community volunteer commissioner Kevin Hebb and myself, and administ administration staff Janice Thompson, Katie Stewart, Jared Kitzer, and Leslie Ray. There are a number of protocols that we have put in place for these virtual meetings. No new written material will be accepted at the meeting. Applicants will be able to present verbally, but no documents will be accepted that were not previously submitted. We will take short breaks at appropriate times over the course of the meeting and potentially a 30 minute break for lunch. During a break, a sign will display on your screen saying that we are on a break and how long the break will be. All participants ask to keep their microphones muted until they are asked to speak. When an application <coughs> excuse me, joins the meeting, I'm explaining the procedure here now because you're all on site. And we ask that you leave the meeting after your application has re reviewed and you can watch online. In the event that the participants participant loses their internet or their connection to your grades or they can't be heard, we ask you leave the meeting and rejoin. And we will take a short five minute break to give you a chance to rejoin. We have a quorum of three men, members, so we will co continue with discussion. If the participant rejoins the discussion has resumed, we will bring them up to date and carry on. If the participant is one of the MPC members and we judge that too much information has been discussed in the interim, and we are in the process of voting, that participant will ask to abstain from the vote. Loss of video does not require a participant to leave the meeting. As long as the participant can hear and be heard, they will be actively participating in the meeting. In the event that I, as chair, lose my connection, I ask that Paul Ryan act as the vice chair in the interim. As if we have a quorum of three members, the meeting can continue. Meeting procedure, we will use the normal meeting procedure where a staff member will review the application and the staff recommendation. Commissioners will ask questions of staff and commissioners will engage the applicants. The applicants will have an opportunity to speak to their application at that point. When the questions and discussions begin, all participants are asked to use the raise hand function in Teams. And I will do my best to acknowledge raise hands in the order they are asked. I ask the participants not bring up a new point of discussion until I acknowledge that there is no further discussion on a current point. Before asking for a vote, I will ask the applicants if they feel they've been heard and their position fairly represented to MPC. Once all discussion is completed, I'll ask for a motion and respond to the first raised hand that I see. Voting procedures to ensure that the meeting minutes are accurate and there is no confusion, we will vote using roll call. I will call for the vote in the name of the order we normally sit in the MD offices, so Paul Clark, Kevin Hebb, Paul Ryan, and I will vote last. I will refer to the motion at the start of the roll call and ask the question, are you in favor of the motion? I ask that everyone answer yes or no. At the end of the roll call, I will state the motion was passed or refused and check with KD, who's keeping minutes, that she's heard all the votes. So on to the agenda. First one is item three. Uh, Oh no, item two, approval of the agenda. Is there any changes? And then I'll move the agenda. Okay, uh, Paul, sort of, go, John. 
Sorry, um, I just wanted to let you know there aren't any changes proposed by staff to the agenda, but there are two letters that were submitted with relation to item 5A5 on the agenda, and they'll be submitted at that time for formal acceptance. And they're in our package or then emailed to us a couple of days ago. That's correct. Yes. Okay, Paul Clark, you made a motion to approve the minutes. All those in favor, Paul Clark. The agenda, excuse me, that was the agenda, Lynn. Oh, sorry, I said the wrong thing. <laughs> yes, the agenda. Paul Clark? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Paul Ryan? Yes. And me, yes. Okay, on to uh, item three, the approval of minutes. Any changes or corrections? No. I ask for a motion to approve the minutes. Sure. Paul Ryan approves the minutes. Everyone in favor? Paul Clark? Yep. Kevin? Yes. Paul Ryan? Yes. And me? Yes. Katie, did you get all that? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay, item four, business arising from prior minutes. Uh, we have the Dead Man's Flats bed and breakfast suite map. Any comments? Just appreciate uh, getting the map every time we have a meeting. Yeah, same here, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the first application then. So the first application is VA1, and I believe the participant, Dunkard Stewart, is online. I'm so here. Jan thank you. Okay, Jan, do you wanna start? Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. This application is submitted by an agent uh, with the consent of the landowner. The owner is in attendance today, as you've noted, and uh, has consented to this application in writing. The property is situated along Baymar Road, which is an extension of Jameson Road. The property is designated a small holdings district, and the application request is to conduct accessory uses on the upper floor of an existing detached accessory building. The main floor of the building would continue to be used as approved pursuant to development permit 3909, specifically as a workshop storage building. The landowner would like to create a private space of his own, a type of man cave, I guess, um, in the building and would like to install some residential features. <clears throat> Pardon me. These are a toilet and sink, but no shower, a TV, a coffee station, which would be a wet bar uh, type of uh, installation, no oven or stove or any other kitchen appliances. And he would like to install a desk and a bookcase for private personal use. There's an existing wood stove in the upper space that would be relocated to another area on the second floor. The project will include removal of some interior framing walls to create one space uh, where previously there were three separate rooms. A cover letter has been attached where more explanation is outlined by the owner as to his use of the space and his reasoning. There's floor plans attached in your agenda material, which further outlined the request. In the background information, there's an existing floor plan layout of the second floor and a proposed layout for the second floor. The drawings um, indicate that they're the main floor layout but what you're seeing are drawings for the second floor. Another part of the application involves the construction of a second floor deck. The construction would be in addition to the existing second floor deck, which was built when the structure was constructed. If MPC choose, a toilet and sink may be installed within the accessory building, but the fixtures must be low flow. The staff recommendation addresses this. When the accessory building was constructed through development permit 39 slash 09, a new sewage handling system was installed to service the building. The MD has received a copy of the septic permit, evidencing that that uh, system was installed in accordance with the provincial regulations. When the landowner purchased the property in 2020, he had the system inspected. 
attached in your MPC uh, agenda package is a copy of this inspection report from last year. The report outlines that the system is functioning properly and provides advice about what should and should not be discharged into the system. If MPC wish further documentation of the system functionality beyond what's provided today, you can modify recommendation number six and request more information. The staff recommendation also addresses the private use of the space by the owner only, and that no suite, bed and breakfast, uh, or home-based business may be operated in the space unless a separate approval is granted for that. The staff recommendation is for approval subject to the recommendation outlined in the report. And that's the end of my presentation, but I'm happy to answer questions. And as noted earlier, the landowner is in attendance today as well. Okay, any questions oh. from the commissioners? Paul Clark? Uh, when you say uh, no kitchen appliances, uh... Uh, Jan, uh, does that include a uh, microwave or a Keurig coffee maker? Are they? Um, are, are you trying to exclude just uh, a stove? Uh, well, I don't. There I wasn't know. any. I'm sorry, Mr. Clark. Um, there wasn't any mention okay. that a microwave would be installed, just the items I mentioned verbally, but the landowner is here, so you could ask him that question. Sure, I'm happy to answer that. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Duncan. Sure, I don't drink coffee, um, <laughs> Mr. Clark, uh, and there's no intentions on putting a microwave. There probably will be a plug-in kettle because I do drink tea. Okay, thank you, uh, Duncan. No problem. Look Any forward other... to meeting you. Yes. This is my next door neighbor. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I have one for Jan. So you asked it in the uh, background that the MP should decide if another sewage inspection might be required. Just what would be the justification for another inspection in your mind? Um, I'm not actually suggesting that there should be another one. I think the system was installed in 2009, um, according to the provincial regulations. And then last year, there's, there's a report saying the system is functioning fine. So my suggestion was just that if MPC wanted another one from this year, it could ask for that. Um, but staff aren't suggesting that you do that. Okay, I just want clarification. Um, I'm on the mind that we're okay with last year's. Does anybody else have any concerns? I do not. Okay. I No, I don't either. Uh... No other questions? No concerns. I, I do. Yes, I have one. Uh, um, sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, I just uh, uh, asking uh, uh, Mr. Stewart if, if uh, all the... Um, uh, requirements of uh, the M uh, uh, the MPC um, uh, are concerning to him. Are there any uh, Are there anything that in the uh, in the approval the, that any any of the conditions of concern? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, no. that's right. Yeah. No. Exactly. No. Okay. Thank you. And that, before we sorry, vote, Kevin. Duncan, do you want to add anything else? Uh, I don't need, no, I don't want to add anything else other than uh, thank you for your time. Okay. Any other comments before we ask for a motion? Can I get a motion then? I'll move. Okay, Kevin moves that we. Okay, accept the uh, staff recommendation as presented. Thank you. Paul Clark, are you in favor? Oh. Um. Yes. Kevin? Yes. Paul Ryan? Yes. And I am too. Katie, did you get that? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. Well, good luck, Mr. Duncan. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.
Okay, on to the next item. So I believe the applicants for item VA2 and VA3 are not here, but VA4 is. So I'm going to suggest we jump ahead to VA4. Everybody okay with that? Yep. Okay. And I believe we have online Mr. Fleona Junkin. So Jan, okay. do you want to jump ahead and review it for us? Yes, just give me a second. I'm just getting there. Page 79. Okay. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Florian Jungen is the agent uh, for the landowner and he is in attendance today. Uh, this application is submitted by the agent, Mr. Jungen, um, on behalf of the landowner, which is a number company. The director of the company has consented to Mr. Jungen making the application. The consent letter is contained in the agenda package. The property is located south and east of the Trans Canada Interchange and the 1X Highway. The property is situated in the Bow Corridor portion of DMD of Bighorn. The property contains approximately 75 acres or 30.6 hectares of land. The request is to renew development permit number 3420, which was issued for a temporary country recreational lodge development for a temporary one year period. Country recreational lodges are listed as discretionary uses in the uh, land use district. So despite the staff accommodation being listed as a permitted use, the entire application has been submitted as pardon me to MPC um, given the discretionary use. The temporary permit is still in effect, but it's due to expire on August 15th 2021. The request today is to renew the exact same development as applied for and approved through development permit 34 slash 20 with no changes being introduced. While the applicant does not suggest any changes to the approval, staff are suggesting that the staff accommodation approval, which is through a separate permit, development permit 25 slash 21, be incorporated into this permit for a permanent approval for the lodge development given they're related. This is due to wording in development permit 2521 for the staff ACOM, which actually linked that building, which is a factory built style of building to the country recreational lodge approval. The uh, lodge request and the staff accommodation request were both approved, but under separate permits and at the renewal stage they were to be combined and linked together and this is because factory built dwellings are not a listed use in uh, the rafter six district mpc might recall that at the time of consideration of the staff accommodation structure members didn't consider it to be a dwelling at the time but rather as a staff accommodation building to support the lodge development Development Permit 2521 outlined that when the Country Recreational Lodge was no longer operating, then the staff accommodation structure needed to be removed and not converted to a dwelling afterwards because factory built dwellings are not listed as a use. The staff recommendation addresses this under the staff accommodation uh, recommended conditions. A cover letter has been provided, which outlines the details of the operation um, and of the lodge itself. In short, the application is to carry on with the existing use of the property as a ranch themed development, which offers guest accommodation and showcases the natural landscape and Western heritage. While the country recreational lodge was operated on a temporary basis in the past, if this renewal is approved, the operators could um, operate the business year round. The Country Recreational Lodge development would involve youth day camps and overnight programs with accommodation in five yurt slash wall tents. There'll also be accessory uses such as educational workshops, meetings, conferences, leadership programs and weddings. 
There's going to be a mix of charitable work at the lodge, as well as revenue generating activities to support the financial viability of the ranch. With respect to numbers of guests, the application outlines that the camp program would accommodate an average of 25 guests, and those guests would stay in the yurts or, or tent structures for up to 12 days. For the accessory uses, the meetings, events, and the weddings, uh, these would range from one day up to five days and would have an average of 25 attendees for the day programs. And there could be up to 100 attendees, and that includes support staff for weddings and similar events. The lodge development includes the renovation of two existing cabins and associated variances for them. One of the variances was for the yurt uh, tent sites, uh, and one was for the cabin that's being renovated to a cookhouse dining hall. The previous development permit granted a variance to the cookhouse dining hall so that it could be a minimum of five meters from the property line. This variance was requested in order to move the yurts back from the easement road that crosses through the property and provides access for um, an adjoining neighbor. The second variance allowed the cabin, the new cookhouse and dining hall, to be a minimum of 4.7 meters from the property line between the two subject properties. And both properties are owned by the, uh, the landowner or applicant. The variances were approved pursuant to section 26.5.2 subsection B of the RSTR district regulations. One cabin will be renovated to become an administration building, as stated above, um, and the other cabin will be renovated to become a cookhouse and dining hall. There's pictures of those two structures in your agenda package, and they are shown on the site plan. At the original approval of the Country Recreational Lodge development, MPC discussed that given this, the subject ranch cookhouse dining hall and the previously approved caretaker's cabin are very close to the property lines, there should be an agreement registered on the property titles to address the maintenance of these structures. Members didn't require this agreement um, at the time of the temporary approval of development permit 3420, but given this application is for a permanent approval of the lodge development, the agreement should be prepared, signed, and registered as a condition of this permit. The staff recommendation number five addresses this. Given the size of the property, which is some 75 acres, Designated parking has not been required to be shown in a plan. There's ample parking on the property for the uses that are being approved. There's been an emergency response plan that was provided and reviewed at the original temporary approval stage. That plan was reviewed by Bighorn's Fire Safety Codes Officer and no concerns were identified. The same plan is being submitted with the renewal today. The emergency plan is not being suggested to be attached to any permit as a schedule. And the reason why uh, we're doing that is so that the plan can be updated from time to time without requiring a development permit amendment. The staff recommendation outlines that any changes to the plan must first be submitted to the MD prior to any changes being made. So there's a little safeguard there uh, for the emergency plan. The applicant has referred the renewal application to the adjacent landowners and lessees, and the MD of Bighorn notified the adjacent municipality, Kananaskis Improvement District, and government departments, including the Stony First Nation. A notification map is located in your agenda package. The responses received to that notification were all in support, and those letters are attached. There was one letter that was received from Alberta Parks that had some suggestions to incorporate into the decision. This letter came in after the package had been prepared, but hadn't been sent yet, so we, we added it to the package. So this letter is in, in your agenda. The suggestions uh, being recommended weren't 
incorporated verbatim into the Country Recreational Lodge recommendation for you guys today. Uh, staff felt that the intent of the suggestions of that letter are, are already in the staff recommendation, uh, number 42 and 49. But if MPC feel that other conditions should be added to reflect Alberta Park suggestions, you can certainly do that and modify the staff recommendation or any condition prior to making a decision. And that concludes my background. Um, the agent, Florian Junkin, is here to answer any questions. I can answer any questions as well. Thanks, John. Okay, any questions from commissioners? Paul Clark? Jen, uh, what are you recommending for a time frame for an approval? I, I can't find it here. There is not a time frame um, for the Country Recreational Lodge development. If you approve the use, um, it would be a permanent approval. So there is no okay, expiry. That's what it, okay, yeah, uh, when you, oh, okay, uh, so uh, thank you. And uh, I, uh, I thought that's what you meant, but you said renewal. So uh, this is uh, uh, establishing it as permanent, uh, essentially. Yeah. That's correct. I don't that's know. correct. Yeah, that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. Other questions? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, I noticed in the preliminary, it mentions okay, generating revenue as well as charitable work. I'm just curious to know if you're going to apply and get the proper paperwork or license from CRA for charitable work. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yep. Yeah, so the um, the ranch is uh, working on. Uh, establishing a charitable foundation um, to run the charitable programs. Okay, thank you. And the second thing, in the preamble it mentioned an average of 25 bed units or average of 25 K guests per night for the 12 days day or less. And in number 11, it's, it says a maximum of 25 bed units. And my question is, as a, re as a retired school teacher, if you're dealing with school groups, that 25 is going to be a little bit too small for many classes. Uh, so I'm wondering if that's going to cause you a problem in the near future. So the programs described in the application are not um, classroom programs. They're um, youth uh, camp programs. Okay. And so we have somebody quite experienced in running youth camps, and those are sort of the numbers that they came up with that are, you know, ideal numbers for um, efficiency, um, yes. number of staff. Um, yep. Hmm. Yeah, and that number is very reasonable. As a classroom teacher, I considered starting at about 23 every extra kid doubled their problems in, in the classroom uh, from the point of view of maintaining proper control and just proper interaction among the students so looking at it from that point of view i think that's a very good number that was all i had at the moment any other questions Okay, I have one for Jen. So the letter that we received from Kananaska's Improvement District, um, they they bring up some good points in my mind, especially about the fire smart principles. I know we deal with recommendations that say in the National Building Code, but I'm wondering, and I, we probably haven't done this in the past, if we should start doing that. Well, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, they speak to having a commitment to fire Fire smart principles around construction for the building exterior and landscaping. And right. just seems that should go along with the national building codes as we go forward. Well, they are separate. The national building code is a provincial code. Um, fire smart are 
different provincial government regulations. So the reason why we didn't um, we didn't really incorporate the clauses verbatim from that letter is with the country recreational lodge uh, renewal. There there isn't any new construction. There's some renovation, but there's no new buildings. Okay. However, if you know if you look in those um, two recommendation numbers, I I see I mentioned uh, 29 and or 42 40. and here we are 42 and 49. 49. Um, there, Which the water. Um, oh, 49 fire smart. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the reason why we we did impose the fire smart conditions you see there um, is because this is new construction. So with the country recreational lodge, there isn't any new buildings being built to apply right. the fire smart principles to. However, under the staff accommodation, it is new construction. So we did put in, um, you know, the fire smart uh, requirements or suggestions. Okay. The other point they brought up was all about the wildlife corridor and making sure that we don't remove too much foliage to inhabit animals. So. I guess the question more for uh, the applicant is whether they're planning to remove any more trees or et cetera around the area. Um, so first of all, we don't have a copy of the letter and we don't have a copy of the staff report, so we don't know what you're discussing. Um, okay, sorry about that. There, We don't have intentions to remove any trees. Um, but again, I, you know, I don't know what you're discussing at this point. I don't have any copy of this. Okay. So, so the letter, just to give you a quick update, was just highlighting they had three concerns around making sure fire smart principles were applied where there was construction. And also, because it's a big issue in the valley now, is just making sure you're not blocking off wildlife corridor or not prohibiting. And the last thing they brought up that's something you might consider, but I don't think it's a recommendation we should worry about is maybe approaching Stony Nakoda to see if there's any spiritual significance in the land that might be part of the education process. Okay. So I guess, Jan, the question for us is, uh, or for you is, will he get a copy of this letter after our, uh, if he didn't get it already? Jan, are you frozen? Oh, we lost yeah. Jan. I went hunting for that letter Lynn and I, what page is it on? Go to page 131 and it's on the opposite side. Okay. Give me this for a and it was received late, I acknowledge that. Yeah. But it did bring up some good points I thought we should bring up to the applicant. Meanwhile, Leslie, do you know if Jan's reconnecting? Yes, we're working with her now. Okay, thanks. Well, Sorry, we... I'm... Sorry, go ahead, Jan. Okay. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Okay, good. Um, okay, so I was asking just came... a question just to say you're going to send a letter to him after the fact just so he has that for his own information? Um, I, I can send him the letter if he would like the letter. Yes, he'll get a written decision outlining the staff recommendation or whatever motion um, you pass. Okay. Uh, I just think I the letter would be of value to him because it brings up some good points, even if we don't include them in the recommendation. Sure. Yeah, no problem. So, I'll just make a note to that. So, Lynn, just for clarification, uh, they talk about in that letter, so point four of that letter, is the preservation of wildlife movement and corridor along wild watercourse. Yep. To my knowledge, there is no designated wildlife corridor anywhere near there. No, and that's why I don't think there's any reason to put a designation here. It's more of awareness because these are issues in the valley, right? There are, it's just I don't like to refer to things as being a wildlife corridor when they're not because all of a sudden people believe it is. Uh, Fair just enough. Be because Canada's country says it's a wildlife movement corridor, that doesn't make it a wildlife corridor. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, I've covered that enough. Is there any other issues? Questions? Paul Clark? No question, uh, Lynn. I just want to move uh, staff rec uh, with everybody.
Before we move on, I just want to make sure that we give the applicant a chance to add anything, if he has anything you'd like to add. Well, first of all, I just wanted to, um, Fiona sends her regrets that she couldn't make the meeting today. She's dealing with some health issues. Um, and so I'm really just here to answer questions. What I would like to do just very briefly is update you on the programs that are um, happening at the ranch. Um, the ranch is partnering with different charities and community organizations and sort of building a network of um, partners to work with. So just a very brief list of some of the, the groups that are using the facilities at the ranch this summer. One is Mountain Moscox, and they help mountain guides cope with post-critical incident stress. Parks Canada and Ken Askis Public Safety are doing training at the ranch. Spirit North, which you might have heard of, um, helping Native youth um, access cross-country skiing, um, organizations that help kids tra uh, transition out of foster care, the Hope Mission, which is a Christian not-for-profit. Uh, um, they've had programs at the ranch previous summers. They're, they're going to be here again this summer. The uh, Duke of Edinburgh, Rocky Mountain Adaptive, it's a charity that um, um, lets people with disabilities access various sports. So. Those are some of the, the organizations that the ranch is already working with, and they continue to sort of build a network of people that will be able to take advantage of the facilities there. Um, so just that's a quick update. If you have any questions, please fire away. Um, just one note, we don't have the agenda package. We don't know the conditions that are being imposed on this um, applications so we we can't address those um so you know i wish i could i wish we had a copy of that so i could raise any concerns or answered questions related to that but i'm just kind of blind right now i have a question of clarification lynn go ahead paul administration can you tell me why the applicant's agent does not have a copy of the agenda package or the conditions uh, we will provide them uh, like if it wasn't requested, but we would provide them. But just for clarity for the applicant, the um, the it's a renewal. So the conditions are basically all the same as they were before, except that we added the uh, staff accommodation and, and permit and amalgamated it in. So okay. generally, they're all the same conditions, but um, I could show it on my screen if if you guys wish or. Well, just was the agenda package not published online? Uh, no, we don't we don't post the um, MPC agenda package on our website. Oh, OK, because I, I've got an internet one for it. All right. Yes, you did. That's how we send it to you. Mm hmm. Okay. But it doesn't. The the uh, there isn't a policy requiring that the uh, MPC package be uploaded onto the website, so it's um, it's it's not there currently. We could discuss that internally as a as a department. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Florin, Florin, are you sorry, Florin? Are you familiar with the prior uh, recommendations? Yes, I am. And um, if the conditions haven't changed from the previous application, we're we're fine with that. I just you know. It, sounded like there's a new letter and recommendations from other jurisdictions. So um, I, I'm just not aware of the content of that. The conditions so the, from the previous um, approval, we're, we are fine with and we don't have any yeah, any other comment towards. So Florin, we're not changing any of those recommendations, but there is some useful information. So I, I'm going to ask Jan to make sure you get a copy of that letter because I think yeah. there's value in it for you guys. Okay, that's appreciated. Thank you. Otherwise, I'm ready for a motion. Paul, did you? Sure. I made it, yeah. Paul okay. Clark makes the motion. Was it Paul? Yes, okay. I made the motion. Yeah. Okay, Paul Clark, are you in favor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Paul Ryan? Yes. And I'm in favor, too, for the recommendations as they're written. Uh, Katie, did you get that? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Good luck, Lauren. Yeah, good luck. Okay, we'll move on to uh, application BA5. Jan, are you ready? 
Uh, yes, I am. I've lost my video, just so you know. Um, so I can't see anyone, but I can hear you. Um, and when, if and when you guys take a break, uh, Lana will just come back and probably I'll go out and see if I can get video again. So I can't see anyone, um, but can see I can you, hear Dan. you. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so yes, um, this application is submitted by Natalie Hayhoe on behalf of the Copperstone Condominium Board of Directors. And as you know, Natalie is here today um, to speak to the matter. And in addition, Rob Koo is also here. He's a unit owner and, uh, and he's in attendance to speak today as well. Uh, the, uh, the minutes, uh, so this application is submitted, as I said, by Natalie Hayhoe, and the, the minutes have been provided um, in your agenda package which outline that the board has assembled and discussed and authorized the application before you today. And the development officer report outlines that there's a consent letter in the background, but, but there isn't. Um, just the minutes are the authority for the board to make the application. The application is for a change in use at the Copperstone Resort from resort accommodation to visitor accommodation with wording to allow a lobby, but the logistics around staffing of that lobby and all other logistics are to be at the discretion of the condominium board. The Copperstone Resort is situated in the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats at 252nd Avenue. The land is designated as Highway Commercial uh, Dead Man's Flats. And I'm losing my computer. <laughs> We're going to have to stop. Um, everything's froze on me. Jan, you okay. can continue your find. Okay, but I've lost my computer, meaning I can't, I don't have the package anymore or um, any of the details for the background. If you just bear with me here for a second, I'm going to try and get it back. Sorry, one moment. Yeah, go ahead, Jan, we'll wait. I apologize. I'll be as quick as I can. Jan, just pop uh, your mute on for a second. Lana's coming back. Yes, one second. Whoops. My apologies, folks. You have a hard copy, uh, Jan, if uh, you can't get your computer back. You're muted, Jan. You lost your... Sorry, just give me a minute. I'm going to log out and come back in. And uh, so just bear with me for a moment. Sorry. Do that.
Miss Chair, it's Leslie, right? Yes. Um, would you be willing, uh, we need a few more minutes. Could we maybe take a five minute uh, break while we work with Jan here? Do you want a little longer, maybe 10 minutes? Might be fair just to okay. get her back. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? It's uh, 945 right now. We'll regroup at 955. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. That's good. Okay, back in 10, guys.
Okay, I don't know. Do we need a motion to come back into order? Uh, yes, you're in a recess, so you will need a, um, well, the chairman can just call the meeting back to order. Okay, well, I'll call the meeting back to order then. Jan, do you want to pick up where you left off? or? Yes, and again, my apologies. I don't know, everything just froze. Um, so just a quick recap, the application is to change the use at the Copperstone Resort from a resort accommodation use to a visitor accommodation use with wording to allow a lobby, but the logistics around the staffing of that lobby and all other logistics to be at the discretion of the condominium board. The Copperstone Resort is situated in the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats at 252nd Avenue and the land is designated as Highway Commercial, Dead Man's Flats. Visitor accommodation is listed as a discretionary use in the regulations, so the application has been referred to MPC for consideration. To provide some background, the Copperstone Resort was originally approved as a hotel with a 75-day length of stay through Development Permit 29-05. There were two conditions within that permit that required a lobby to be maintained until phase two of the Copperstone uh, was built. After phase two was built, the unit being used for the lobby or an office could be returned to an accommodation unit. When the LUB changed a little while later, the use of hotel was changed to visitor accommodation and it still had the length of stay provision, provision in the definition. In 2013, a new land use bylaw was passed and a new use resort accommodation had been added to the list of uses in the district. This use had no length of stay provision. Shortly after the new land use bylaw was adopted, Copperstone Resort applied to change the use from a visitor accommodation use to a resort accommodation use. In essence, what the difference was that um, there was no length of stay provision for resort. And that change in use was approved through development permit number 49 slash 13. This permit 4913 included the same requirement that there be a lobby for the resort until phase two was built. It wasn't very long after the resort accommodation use was added to the bylaw that the use was removed uh, by council. The effect this had was that the current resort accom use at Copperstone became an existing non-conforming use pursuant to the MGA. This meant that the use could continue to be operated, but the use couldn't be altered or amended except to make it conform. The Copperstone Resort had operated under the resort accommodation use with no length of stay provision since that time. A few months back, Copperstone contacted the MD of Bighorn and wanted to amend the resort accommodation permit to alter the condition requiring the lobby. However, given the resort accommodation use was now an existing non-conforming use, the permit couldn't be altered as requested. Copperstone Condo Board was advised that if they wanted to amend the permit, they'd have to change uh, to a conforming use within the district. So Copperstone then submitted the subject application for a change in use to visitor accommodation and provided wording changes for conditions as it related to having a lobby. In short, Copperstone Board of Directors would like the operational aspects of the lobby for things such as hours of operation, the staffing complement, the use of self-check-in technologies and guest services to all be at the discretion of the condominium corporation. Staff recommendation number seven sets out the wording uh, from the corporation with some minor modifications by the MD. The regulations for visitor accommodation are contained within section 4.20 on page 77 of land use bylaw 09Z18. The staff recommendation reflects these regulations. A cover letter has been provided outlining the reasons that the corporation wishes to change. The letter is in your agenda package. 
In short, the reasons are that with technology today and advertising on the internet, um, you know, on sites such as the Airbnb platforms, and then compounded with the ability to remotely communicate with guests, the board wanted flexibility with respect to check-in and registry requirements to extend to the owners as well, and not just to the resort lobby. It was also expressed about the high cost of staffing a central lobby service when many owners are managing their own units and renting them privately. Last, the corporation has outlined that they have created a safety committee and will be improving or creating security policies to mitigate any security concerns that might arise with the removal of the lobby. One item for MPC to consider though with the removal of the lobby and the guest check-in is how there will be assurance that the 75 day length of stay will be followed by all owners and that there won't be any long-term stays. This has been a bylaw enforcement issue in the past at the resort. Other concerns might be with security issues, vandalism, unauthorized guests, disturbances or other emergencies. There's an issue if there's an issue at the resort, emergency personnel will want the guest registers. Who will provide them? How will guest registers be collected and how will the MD know who and how to get these individual registers if they're needed when there isn't a central registry system? Instead of one central guest register, there could be up to 100 individual ones to manage. And this is just on this property alone. These above concerns seem to be reflected in some of the notification comments that the MD of Bighorn received. Another implication is that without a staffed lobby, Bighorn's Fire Safety Codes officer stated that lock boxes will now be required to be purchased and installed by Copperstone. The staff recommendation has included this as a requirement. The applicants were required to notify its unit owners with the details of the change in use application, and this was done. The MD notified adjacent properties to the resort. Within your agenda package, there's a notification map with proof of notification. We received a substantial number of responses uh, to the notification, and the responses are all within your agenda package. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's a mix of those unit owners that are in support and a number of unit owners opposed. And there's valid points on both sides, with most responses addressing the removal of the lobby and only a few relating to the change in use. Two additional letters were received after the package had been sent out to members, and those have been sent to you previously, but you'll need to accept them today as part of the minutes. Staff recommendation number seven has been drafted to require a lobby, but it includes wording as to the operational logistics of staffing of that lobby to be at the discretion of the condominium corporation. MPC has the ability to change the recommendation or any of them if you wish. There's another condition that has been drafted requiring a copy of the condominium bylaws, which show that they are consistent with Bighorn's current land use bylaw regulations. A further sentence was added requiring a draft copy of any amended bylaws prior to them being adopted. This is so that the MD can ensure that the bylaws stay consistent with the current land use bylaw. Um, the land use bylaw actually does allow for um, for staff to or a condition to be imposed requiring these bylaws. The staff recommendation is for approval uh, subject to the conditions outlined. And I wanted to point out that there's a typo in the staff recommendation number nine. Please change the word resort accommodation to reflect the word visitor accommodation when you pass your motion. And last, MPC can alter, remove, or change any staff recommendation in the report. And that concludes my background information, but I'm happy to answer any questions. 
And as I noted earlier, Natalie Hayhoe, the agent, is here today, who can also answer questions, as is Rob Koo, who's a unit owner within the complex. And I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, okay, we'll start with questions to Jan about what she presented. Paul Clark? Oh, did you change your mind? Uh, uh, I, I did, uh, um, but I, I do have a question for Jan. Uh, um, the, uh, I don't know if you, you can answer this, Jan. Uh, um, the, uh, the the units have uh, a board of directors, correct? And those board of directors yes. are elected board of directors? Uh, yes. Okay. By the residents? I would assume by the so. Owners, by the owners of the... Of the resort. Uh, condominiums or, or the resort, yeah, okay. That's my understanding. Uh, uh, Natalie can jump in if, if that's not correct. No, no that's, that's correct. correct, yeah. Go ahead, Natalie, yeah. That's correct, yeah. Any other questions for Jan? Yeah, the, um, the request to remove the lobby, uh, it seemed to me uh, that um, this would be analogous to a, an apartment building uh, where uh, there are individual units, but uh, everybody's responsible for their own unit. Is that correct? Yes, in, in short, what would happen if the lobby was removed and there wasn't an office or a lobby within the condominium complex then each individual owner is now responsible for complying with um you know with the the land use bylaw keeping a guest register no long-term use and so on thank you okay that's all i had lynn okay anybody else okay then um would the applicant like so, to speak sorry I, think lynn, I have a question i have a question for jan Go My ahead, mic Paul. was muted and I was having trouble turning on. Jan, I, I'm just going back quickly here, but didn't you put a condition in the approval here that a registry still be maintained and be available to the MD of Bighorn? Yes, the land use bylaw requires that even if there isn't a lobby, there must be a guest register. And if there isn't a central system, then each landowner, each unit owner is going to have to keep their own. That's okay. Condition so eight. Um, so I, I, re, I was around when this was originally approved and I know why the guest register is required. Um, uh, and in here you say that it has to be available to the MD of Bighorn. Where does it say that they don't have to have one on each land, each property owner can maintain one? That's an either or. Anybody? It's one of the questions I have of, of the board. How are they going to manage some of that? Yeah, I can speak to that. So I think the first question actually that was raised sort of spoke to this. So this application, um, we received quite a bit of legal advice prior to filing this application. Um, and we were told from our legal advice that we would have to seek a special resolution amongst owners, which is a super majority of 70% of owners to actually um, would have to run a special resolution to change any condo plans and remove the lobby itself. Um, I think it was suggested um, by one of the planners at the time that we just remove the lobby and allow its conversion to a residential unit. So that's, um, we actually decided to hold off on that. And that's, we're not actually seeking that with this application. Um, there's a caveat there that maybe in the future, if, if you know technology progressed even further, we might not need a lobby space. But right now, this application is actually just requesting um, some flexibility in terms of the lobby space, the management model, um, and that we be able to utilize more technology that doesn't require the physical staffing and front desk check-in um, 
at the resort. So we're actually going to keep the space there. The uh, management company that we're working with, Canmore Premier, is really on board actually with shifting to more of a remote check-in service. Um, and we have a whole security committee that's been run um, over the course of the past year. And there's a few systems out there like Operato or remote, remote Lock or whatever that actually arguably can keep a better track of who's coming and going from the building via electronic locks and the security system. Um, right now, there's no security cameras. There's an outdated keypad and fob system. So we're just asking for flexibility that there be more of a floating management model um, and an installation of a more up-to-date check-in system. And this was sort of expediated during COVID. Um, people don't want to be gathering in a front lobby space anymore. Um, prior to that, about 70% of the ownership had indicated that they would like to be managing their own check-in systems. And they have been quite successfully now for five to 10 years via a bunch of different sites, Airbnb, VRBO. I mean, this is nothing new. We're just trying to bring the management model up to date um, with what has currently been going on and the existing technology. And, um, and we just, we're just seeking to do it above board. The previous uh, management company that was in there, Clique, basically for 15 years prior said, we're not managing 70% of the units, do as you please. And there was no registry being kept by self-managed owners. So now we're just seeking to really bring the resort up to date with an electronic check-in system, work with Canmore Premier, the new manager, um, and have everyone on more of a centralized system. One of the systems we're probably leaning towards is Operto, which, um, is more centralized actually than the current system with the front desk. Okay, so uh, let's go back to my question. Uh, okay. I was around when this originally came through. I know why the 75 days there. I know why the requirement for the registry is there. Okay. Because yeah. we are constantly dealing with complaints about people's converting these things into long-term stay units rather than short-term stay units. And so yeah. when bylaw heads over there because of a complaint, where is the register? Right now or in the, or what we hope for in the future? Where is it going to be? Well, under any remote check-in service, you can, there's super administrators on the system. Every, every unit, every access um, can be pulled on every single unit, every single door. And with the installation of actual cameras, in the parking garage, service parking to the west, and on the street, you'd be able to pull all license plates. And, and and so where is the register? Physically, where is the register? You would approach the super administrator, which would be Canmore Premier, and they would be able to pull you all information via whether it's Operto, links, whatever. It would Janice, all be on. Is administration satisfied with that? Um, this is very new. This is the first one. So we don't really, I, I guess I just don't know whether that um, would be acceptable or not. I think the idea is that if the MD of Bighorn wants to see that register, it needs to be available. And But we don't know who we're getting it from, where it's coming from. Well, There's I'll some just, logistics. I'll so, just add it now, like in its current state, and probably for the past 10 years, um, it's it has been super fragmented. So you have about 30% of the owners you'd be able to walk up to the front desk now and get that information from. But prior to all of this being filed, more self-managed owners were not keeping adequate registries themselves. So now this is just being, it's almost being more centralized. Um, we're just asking for flexibility to direct the resources of the condominium, instead of spending 200 grand on a front desk that's not working anyways, direct it to a more up-to-date, centralized check-in, check-out system that everyone is on. So Jan, just to, to go back to that then, your uh, recommendation eight was about having that register, but nowhere in there does it mention that we should have access to a centralized register. Because to Paul's point, I think there is a concern that 
we don't want to dump all the overhead on the administration staff to chase everybody down if there's no front desk manager who can chase stuff down for us, right? Generally, yes. That's what we're looking for is it um, if we need to see it because maybe there's a complaint or there's someone's renting long term, we need to be able to see that register to prove or disprove that there's any uh, infraction. So I guess what I'm asking is could we maybe change recommendation date to say we want to know what the centralized register management system is and who the point of contact is to get expedite, like get things quickly. I, I'm more worried about bylaw issues and emergency evacuation issues and like it's got to be centralized, right? So, so any system, be it Lynx, Remote Lock, Operto, they have several super administrators. So Canmore Premier would be one of them, the current um, on-site management company, and they're pretty on board with all this. They're moving that way in a lot of their resorts. Um, Pika is one, and the MD could easily be another. So well, quick, quick question for you then. Uh, as part of uh, this centralized register system, are you guys actually coming up with an emergency evacuation plan that's going to use your register system? Yeah, so um, all of these, um, and this was the whole purpose of the security committee, was looking into the logistics of how is this actually going to work. So all of these bigger systems have um, like a common emergency code. And then furthermore, to meet fire code, there is... Um, these fire boxes that are installed various locations be it the front doors the parking garage whatever with um manual keys fobs all of that for the fire department so quick yeah. question is back to the fire is if we have a sudden evacuation plan because of a forest fire i mean most yeah. of the hamlets here have community associations who have full lists of who the permanent residents are to give the fire department right away who would do that in your situation one of the super administrators on the system, most likely Canmore Premier, who's the on-site management group. And that's it, that would be the case now. They would do that. It's just, we're just requesting flexibility to move from the staffed front desk to have more of them a floating model. Like realistically, their presence is gonna be virtually the same at the resort. It's just not necessarily in the form of a leased front desk. I guess the question is, without a physical person to go to, what do the fire station people or, or whoever that's bylaw know who to go to, right? It's that one point of contact. Um, well, I think there will be a physical person there. They just might not be sitting there with, you know, two or three colleagues at the front desk. And also there's constant maintenance staff on staff at the resort as well. Okay. Paul? Um, Natalie, sorry, Natalie, you talked about uh, have, having to have a 70% resolution uh, legally. Have you got that? No, we haven't run it yet because we were informed that um, like running a special resolution, I think, is a whole different undertaking. And we wanted to first address the development permit. We would maybe seek that next year or the year after if uh, it depends on what ownership wants. If ownership wants to see the space still physically stay there and just have more, it'd still just be like a centralized hub, even if it's more of an electronic check-in system. I mean, Canmore Premier is still going to need office space one way or the other. Um, then, then we would run it. It's just going to, it would reflect what ownership wants. Um, but it's, it's a process. I mean, you have to I mean, send out all these papers and gather a vote and whatnot, so. So just for clarification, uh -huh. uh, if we approve this and then we send bylaw over to test drive the registry, what's gonna happen? Well, one set, well, if you were to approve it now under the current front desk system, you'll find a current, you'll find it very fragmented. You'll have to be approaching owners individually because we're not all on one system. Um, owners have been notified that they better pull up their socks in terms of gathering all names of guests and license plate, but it is ultimately still fragmented. But um, we hope to have our new security system. We're leaning towards either Lynx or Operto installed and up and running within the next six months. Um, 
it'd be quite easy for you. Actually, you would approach Canmore Premier. You would ask them to pull up any unit number, uh, the number of guests, the names, license plate, and it should all be on that system. It, it yes. should. So right yeah. currently, from what I just heard you say, you are not in compliance with your current approval. No. Or, nor you, no, would you be in compliance with this one if we approved it. So I'm just asking administration right now in order to uh, encourage a timely creation of a easily accessible register, should we be issuing a stop order for Copperstone? No, but I would encourage well, I'm, not ask, you. I'm sorry, oh. I was asking oh, our sorry. administration. Sorry. Um, the, the stop order is an enforcement technique once there has been a complaint and um, an infraction discovered. There's no complaint right now. Uh, with respect to Copperstone, there have been in the past in terms of some owners renting long term well, with I'm leases really and everything. But um, should we issue a stop order right now? No, um, I wouldn't right now because I don't have a complaint and I haven't conducted any investigation as to what, you know, we, we'd have to have an infraction or be aware of something before I could issue a stop order. I was um, just informed by the applicant that they're not in compliance with the requirement to keep a register. Some owners, uh, private, some private owners maybe um, are not. And, and I, you know, and that is a bit of an issue. Um, I think we'd like to see it become more cohesive and have things come together so that we don't want to have to chase. We've got enough work to do. Uh, I think that the information needs to be there as per the bylaw if we ask for it or if we get a complaint. So I think on the Copperstone end, they need they just need to have themselves organized so that if we come asking, the information's there. So can we put a condition in here, Jan, that requires them to demonstrate the availability of a central registry within 30 days of us approving this? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, it's a well, discretionary it use. So mm -hmm. you certainly have the ability to impose conditions that you feel as long as those conditions aren't uh, contrary to the land use bylaw. So, so you could. Yeah, we require a registry. And yes. as a condition, we can add to condition number eight uh, that the applicant demonstrate the availability of a central registry within 30 days. Well, Paul, I think we heard it's going to take them six months. Yeah. Really? So you're going That's to be out of compliance for the next six months when it comes to a registry? So, so let me throw this question out to you, Jan. Is they're not in compliance now. We're making approvals to change their whatever designation. What physical changes does that do for them now? Nothing. I mean, I, I get how it changes so they meet the compliance with the bylaw. I'm just wondering, is there a point to postponing this until we can ensure they're compliant? Is that an approach we could take? That's absolutely an approach and an option you could take. You could postpone a decision on this for whatever time frame, six months until the central registry system is in place and functioning and there's uh, the demonstrated um, uh, appearance that, that there's compliance and then the application could come back for a decision at that time. Because it does feel to me a bit like we're putting the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse. Um, how do the rest of you feel? I feel exactly the same way, Lynn. Uh, um, um, and I'm going back to 70% uh, compliance. Uh, it, it, it seems to me, given uh, the correspondence we had against this particular uh, proposal, uh, that... Uh, that there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that don't want to comply with this. They still want to lobby. They want the same thing as they've got had in the past. And uh, so, I I think I would need to see that that uh, the uh, um, that resolution is passed uh, before I could approve this. Um, but we aren't sure that we actually want to remove the lobby space. 
that would so, just be because you have to run a special resolution to change the condo plans. We aren't sure we want to change the condo plans. We just wanted to have the option of a more floating management model. And if I'm correct in understanding this, the issue is with your owners that they need to understand that some of the issues they're getting addressed are, are being resolved by this common registry, centralized registry, which based on the against letters, I get a sense none of them have a sense of what you're planning. So they are holding. So, so the question I still have is because we did get eight that were in favor, 15 that are against. And we still don't know what the central registry looks like, as Paul pointed out. Uh, I so still... it'll, it'll either be in the form of operto or links, which are two very commonly used electronic check-in systems. Um, the board just has to vote probably within the next week or two, and then installation can begin. We've had both companies out to run um, all the diagnostic tests. Um, it just does take them a few months to install because they're running wires and it's just a little bit of physical work. We but, just, um, as the board, thought it was prudent um, to be above board and file the development permit application before going ahead with the logistics. So, And, and until you can actually meet our uh, conditions, we really have trouble approving this. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think that's the dynamic we're stuck in here. I guess the only thing I would say to that is that the condo under Clique, who was the previous property manager, they weren't meeting any of your conditions. They were meeting your conditions less so for the last 10 years. Like we're trying to move in the direction of compliance. Um, and, and we like seeing that, but I yeah. guess we're still saying, I think you're too early to make this without knowing that we can see that, right? I'm, I mean, we like where you're headed in terms of a centralized registry. That's great. But you're not addressing any of the other issues until we know that. And I know on my own hit list is two of the, the against were actually the local community who don't know what you're planning. And they've already raised some concerns about parking and pets in their neighborhood. And I know with Dead Man's Flats, we've made a point to ensure that people have primary residence are very responsible with their B&Bs and their visitor suites so that we know who to go to. Um, but we don't have that yet with you guys, so. Well, I mean, I think you could directly approach the owner the same way in that you approach the owner in, in a house in Dead Man's Flats in Rivers Bend or whatever about their basement suite. Except this is a hundred individuals versus the handful of individuals. Um, so what are the rest of you thinking? Where, where are we at? Kevin, any uh, thoughts? Yes, I had problems with this as soon as I read it because it looked as if the condominium board or, or corporation was pushing through something that appeared to be opposed by a large, a large proportion of their membership. And the whole plan, as Natalie has explained, it sounds good once it's been implemented, but I don't think that's been adequately communicated to your membership. And uh, uh, my problem with an approval is that if we would approve this, uh, a lot of your membership will think it's a done deal and you won't get as much opposition. So as was said, the cart is before the horse, in my opinion, and we need to see approval from your membership and then action as quickly as possible. And then we can probably go ahead and approve this. And we need a phone number of the company you're using and mm -hmm. some kind of assurance that we can get the necessary information within a reasonable time in an emergency, which I would think would be within an hour in an emergency. And I do not know these companies, so until you've got some way to show us that we can get the information quickly by phoning this number and that the MD is authorized to access that information, I just don't see how we can help you. Paul Clark? Uh, Natalie, uh, I'm a bit confused on this as well uh, um, because... Uh, um, uh, there, it appears to me that, uh, that, um, 
some people want to do everything themselves and don't necessarily want a centralized system. They don't need it. Uh, and uh, and what assurances we have which, uh, when you uh, engage to this company that you've uh, suggested uh, that would look after the the, the uh, register that everybody would have their input into that register. Um, well, depending on the system we go with, everyone is required to have the same lock on their door and the same and the software login software. So you have no other option so, but but using that. So everybody now is now it's quite disjointed. I think we've got about six or seven different types of locks on there, um, and the ownership too, right? Like it's. Yeah, about 70% of people are doing self-check-in and have been for many years now. And about 30% are going via the front desk. So there's that fragmentation and then the fragmentation currently among existing self-management. So it would just make it a lot more consistent. Uh, I, I agree with the other members of the uh, uh, MPC here that, uh, that it's a uh, laudable um, destination uh, but um, the path that I have still can uh, still confused with is that um, uh, what if uh, how, how do you make owners comply to well, register to use this registry they would have no other form of accessing their unit because the doors are common condo property I see. Okay. Thank you. I got it. Paul Ryan. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so a couple of things. So we are exactly where we were trying desperately to avoid going with the original approval for Copperstone. And we had a lot of promises made, uh, which as I just heard from you have not been fulfilled and the registry was key to that approval for that type of model. And you don't need an approval from us to go and have those locks installed on all those doors. As you said, it's your condo property. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the community. I have, believe me, absolutely no interest in concerning myself with condominium politics. I got enough mm -hmm. trouble with municipal politics. Um, <laughs> but you could actually go ahead, install the locks, pick a super manager for it, have a system running and come mm -hmm. back to us and be able with the click of a mouse, as you say, how easy it would be to haul up the registry on our screen and show us exactly how it works. Yep. And right now they couldn't manage a book with a pen and a piece of paper to keep a registry. Well, I, I think it just speaks to how the ownership has shifted. And I, I did just want to interject previously, but I didn't. It's it's so much. I think when Copperstone was approved, it was under these rental pool management models, which whether we agree or disagree with it, the hospitality industry in general has shifted away from that. Um, so now we're left with a resort with 70% of people not part of any pool at all. There is no official pool that was dissolved because it has to meet the 40% threshold. Um, so we have 30% of owners still participating in it with the 70% not. So we're trying to still maintain this centralized front desk management system with 70% of ownership not utilizing it and that's sort of where this all came from because there were people that contact like there was a, like there was an emergency agm called in september because 70 percent of ownership said it's illegal under the condominium act to use common funds for the benefit of only select owners and there was a class action lawsuit threatened and everything because 100 percent of owners are paying to fund a front desk that only services 30%. I, 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 I get that. Uh, and these are all internal conflicts that you have in your condominium yeah. association. Uh, 
Yeah. Our concern here is compliance with their land use bylaws. Yeah. That's our concern. Mm -hmm. Not condo politics. And what you're asking us to approve, you told me you can't do, uh, but you plan on doing it. And that sounds so much like what I heard with the original approval. And I know that the management model has changed because financial institutes are very reluctant to lend money for this type of product where once upon a time they were. And so times have to change. I get that. Uh, and I appreciate you wanting to be in compliance. Uh, but until you can demonstrate to us that you can be in compliance, I'm not inclined to support your application. I'm actually, Madam Chair, going to make a motion that it be postponed until the applicant can demonstrate a working registry. And quick question for Jan. What is the best procedure if we want to do that? Postpone or outright refusal and they come back to us? What would you recommend? I'll argue, Madam Chair, that you postpone it because an, a, a postponement cannot be appealed. If you decline it, it can be appealed and it'll just bounce around for a while. Uh, I'm suggesting that a motion to postpone is the appropriate motion. And that way it gives the applicant some time to be able to demonstrate the system rather than go to the SDAB and have us argue that you are not in compliance with a condition, nor can you be in compliance with the condition. And, and having sat on the SDAB, I've got a pretty good inclination of where that would go. Okay. Quick question then, Jan, for condition eight, would we then postpone, but maybe change the condition to, to speak to that? We want a demonstrated central registry system. When or would we deal with that later? Uh, oh, uh, I'm unmuted. Sorry. Um, you you can't. You can give me direction right now that you, the wording you want in number eight, when it comes back to you, if you postpone. So if okay. you postpone this t decision, um, I'd kind of. If there's a date. A date might be better than as opposed to postponing indefinitely. So a, a date would be preferably uh, or preferable to staff so that we know when to bring it back to you. Okay. Otherwise, I, it just waits indefinitely. I have a strategy, Madam Chair. Yes. So uh, administration has heard our concern about the ability to demonstrate a functioning registry. So I'm confident that that would be in the conditions. Uh, and by my motion to postpone until the applicant can demonstrate one doesn't have a fuse on it. Uh, but when it, we have our next MPC meeting and we're going through the minutes, I'm going to ask, have they provided us with a working registry? And if not, then I'm going to ask why we are not having bylaw go and enforce the original approval. And that'll trigger a whole different process. Just as a question, are we, would you define a working registry if you were to approach individual owners now and they are to provide that information for you? Because I know for ourselves, we um, own one unit in there and manage two and just via the systems that are used, you know every, you know the guests in the unit and we're pretty diligently requiring um, license, all license plate photos to be submitted. I can't speak for all owners, but I'm, from the, uh, we know a large group of them and they're also also complying is that when I say there is no centralized registry but I mean if you are to approach owners who are on title they are able to provide that information so does that count as a working registry your original approval required the condominium corporation to maintain a registry it didn't say anything in there about having our bylaw guys going around banging on a hundred doors to ask them how many people have you had staying here and for how long, especially with units that are going to be vacant. And right. Under, under the condo act, the condo, the condominium corporation isn't re responsible for the administration of the building. That's either outsourced to a individual owners or B a management company, which is what currently is in place. But you, you, told us and I and I believe you that there's a number of software products out there that if you put 
uh, electronic uh, communicating locks on every door mm -hmm. that somebody can press a button and see if that is occupied. And they can tell you with the click of a mouse how many units are currently occupied. That's yeah, a registry. That that's the that would be the up to date form of it. It's current form I would say is not up to date but is still operating in to some degree it, to to a degree. If you were to approach any owner now, we had clarification from the planning department previously that owners are required to be in compliance with the development permit. Um so that's why I'm just questioning if we can outright say we're not in compliance right now we are in compliance it's just very fragmented and that's why we're moving in this direction so what it says is the condominium corporation as an entity shall ensure that a guest register is kept and maintained for all guests staying at the resort right so can, can you do that right now yes technically we could because the condominium corporation in and of itself, like we received a pretty extensive legal opinion from Roberto Noche on this. The condominium corporation is not a separate legal entity, but is representative of all owners. So all owners by purchasing in Copperstone Resort are, bo are, the, are bound by the provisions of the development permit. So you're telling me that the condominium association is not registered in Alberta? No, it is registered, but it's it's representative of all owners. So by purchasing in Copperstone, you are obligated to abide by the conditions of the development permit. You are rep you are representative you are rep represented by the condominium corporation, which the development permit was issued to. It's so not its, own, it's 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 its separate entity, but it's representative of all owners. It's a legal corporation. It's a condominium. I'm I'm not yeah. here to argue with you. I'm here yeah. to try to help you get into compliance. And Madam Chair, yeah. I'm starting to become more inclined now to refuse this application and uh, let them go through the legal process. Uh, I would prefer to postpone it and give them an opportunity to demonstrate a working register. Uh, and uh, in the future, we may ask our bylaw to go over there and ask them to demonstrate it to them as well. Because this has been a problem since for a long, long time. And right now, this is not a resolution. Well, quick question for Natalie. If we did postpone it, how long would you want a postponement for? Um, I would say six months, just so first off, the board can vote on which exact system. I can. It would either be Lynx or Operto. We're planning on voting on our next board meeting. Um, and then the installation, we've been told would be rather quick, would be within a week. But obviously, there's a bunch of electrical work um to be done so i would say four to six months it was our goal to start september october um yeah. but as we know with anything renovation related things can take longer than normal and also we have our agm as well in october so um the board will be re-elected then so just to make sure that that board is still on board with the system that was selected and all of the installation procedures. So I'm inclined, Madam Chair, to uh, put a six month time limit on it. I've, I've got no problem with that because right now you're not in compliance. So if we have a problem, we already have remedies. And judging from the letters that I saw, uh, you may have a totally different condo board after your next uh, election. So I think it is prudent of you to uh, follow what's recognized process when it comes to that. So Madam Chair, I'll amend my motion to postpone for six months to provide the applicant an opportunity to demonstrate a working registry system. So I think I heard Jan say she'd prefer a date. So if we go six months out, that's December 31st. Is that what you want to do? On New Year's Eve, we'll all go check the locks. <laughs> January 31st then, one more. <laughs> January 1st. Okay. Yeah, 2022. Okay, did you get that, Katie? Yeah, somewhat. Um, if Paul Ryan doesn't mind just repeating it for me really quick. There's just a motion to postpone uh, this application until January the 1st, 2022, to provide the applicant an opportunity to demonstrate a working registry system. 
And um, may I please interject? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead, Dan. Um, MPC doesn't meet on January 1, 2022. Could I please suggest that your postponement date be to an MPC meeting in January of 2022? Um, in December of 2021, because now you're gone past six months. Right, um, but it could be a seven month postpone maybe or it, I, it doesn't matter to administration which date you choose I just would like the date to be an MPC meeting date not another date within that month practically December is not a good month Paul so I'd say January. yeah fair, fair enough Lynn I agree with you there sure why not I'm happy with that just pick whatever your calendar date is there Jan for okay Paul Clark, January. Do you have something uh, this is a uh, uh, just a suggestion uh, to uh, uh, um, Paul's uh, motion is that uh, uh, insert the word centralized uh, because uh, right now yes. I think Natalie is suggesting that there is a system that's working but uh, but it isn't centralized. Uh, in other words, the MD would have to find every owner themselves which is what we do, don't want. Yeah. Do you accept that as a friendly amendment? I do, yes. Okay. okay, Katie, have you got that? Yes, I do, thank you. Sorry, what was that date in January? It was what again, sorry? The 19th is what I have, Jan. Yeah, yeah it would be the third Wednesday, Natalie. Um, yeah. I don't have a calendar in front of me, but Katie is saying that's the 19th and that sounds probably about right. So. Yeah. Thank you. And just for clarification, Natalie, that's the deadline. If yes. you if you have this system up and running before then, there's mm -hmm. no reason why you can't ask to come back. So would we just reach out again and say, would you like to see a demo or what would you prefer? You can sort all that out with our bylaw and our planning department. Okay. Uh, when this application comes back, I am going to want to see it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome to come out and even have a walk around. Um, Actually, we don't, and planning commissions do not do site visits. Oh, okay. Well, we've been, but, we've got legal advice advice on that of our own. So not about okay. you, but just with any applicant. Okay. Okay, let's uh, go to a vote then. Paul Clark, in yes. favor of the amended motion? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Paul Ryan? Yes. And I too am in uh, agreement. So Katie, you got all that? Yes, I did, thank you. Well, Natalie, we thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing your future works. Good luck. Thank you, it still feels like progress on our end. So thank you for your time. No, you're headed the right way. We thank you for that. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Natalie, and good luck. Thank you, have a good day, bye. All right, all right where are we? Back. To agenda item, I believe two. Yes, I believe that is right too, Lynn. I'm just going to go there. All right. Uh, did you want me to start? Yeah, Roger? go ahead, Jan. Okay. So this application is submitted by the landowners of the property at Norman Shelley Drager. The application is to renew an expired development permit number 11 slash 19, which was issued for a change in intensity to install a toilet and sink in an existing accessory building and to connect and to connect <laughs> that toilet and sink to the existing sewage handling system on the property. The subject lot is located in the hamlet of Lac des Arc at number five, Mountaineer Close. The property is designated as R1 district and changes in intensity require a development permit as per the land use bylaw. The application has been referred to MPC for consideration as it was the original approver of that permit. The project has not been completed as yet so the landowners would like the permit renewed or I guess a, a new approval so that they can complete the project. 
A change to the application is that instead of connecting the accessory building to the existing sewage handling system, the landowners would like to install a separate system to accommodate the toilet and sink. To provide a bit of history, development permit number 47 slash 10 was issued for the existing dwelling and the attached garage. In 2013, through development permit number 17 slash 13, the landowners constructed the subject detached accessory building. The accessory building has been deemed complete pursuant to the building permit. A little later, there was a small bylaw enforcement matter with the accessory building. And the issue was the installation of bedrooms into this structure. The bedrooms have since been removed and the building is now deemed to comply with the municipal bylaws. During review of the proposed floor plan layout, it was noticed that a separate space had been closed off from the rest of the interior of the building. On the south side of the building, there's a, a wall that's been closed off. Uh, this isn't an issue, provided the space is only used for storage and not as a separate sleeping space. And the staff recommendation does address this. While the land use bylaw doesn't prohibit servicing of accessory buildings with toilets and sinks, it's not encouraged in hamlets unless there is a demonstrated need. MPC decided at a previous land use bylaw review that each request for a toilet in an accessory building in a hamlet should be treated separately and on individual merits. One consideration should be that any servicing of a building uh, should be regulated so that it doesn't become a bylaw enforcement issue in the future. In 2019, MPC had approved the installation of the toilet and sink into this accessory building and conditions were imposed to prohibit any residential occupancy, suite, or home-based business. As required by the land use bylaw, the landowner did effect notification of uh, his renewal application to the adjacent landowners. Three neighbors were notified as per the notification map in the agenda package, and all three neighbors responded in support. These are in the agenda package for review. Uh, I just wanted to point out in the development officer's report, it wrongly outlines that two responses were in writing and one was a verbal. While this was stated by the landowner in the beginning, uh, later on, um, and since then, all the neighbors had responded in writing. These were provided um, in either a text or an email. Given the MPC have previously provided approval for the toilet installation, the staff recommendation is for approval of the request subject to the recommended conditions. And that is the end of my background information, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Paul Clark? Jen, uh, what I hear you saying is that uh, this uh, is the same as the last approval with the exception that they're going to put in a separate septic system for the, this particular building. And that's right. the only major change. That's uh, correct. Thank you. Yeah. All right. right. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Jan. A couple of things. Um, so in the original development permit for this, uh, was it not stipulated in there that no sleeping accommodations could be provided? It was a condition of the original approval. And then I can't hear can't you. Can't hear you, Dan. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, typically uh, when there's an accessory building and something like this, a washroom or toilet going in, we, we as a matter of course say you can't sleep in an accessory building. And, and we write that into the conditions, don't we? Yes, we do. And, and then we provide those conditions to the applicants so that they would know what their conditions are? That's correct, in a permit. Okay, perhaps they just missed that condition when they were reading it. Uh, Maybe. So uh, you're talking about uh, one of the bedrooms that has now been closed off. Is that on the second floor? Uh, there is a um, bedroom on the main floor and there was one upstairs as well. Yeah, okay. I just remember my days in construction that uh, they used to be called bonus rooms because they would be completely framed in until after the occupancy permit and then they cut the hole for the door. Um, certainly, I don't 
I don't believe that that's the case here, but uh, I am concerned about compliance. So how are we going to follow up on this? Uh, do you diarize that to go back and make sure they just don't put the bed back in the room again? Uh, no, once it's been, uh, once we have a complaint and once there's been enforcement and once it's been corrected and closed, we don't go back and check. Um, I mean, I may instruct bylaw to keep an eye out, um, but unless we have a complaint, the direction of council is that we don't go looking for infractions. So you already had a complaint, so someone already is keeping an eye out. Um, and I'm sure they won't stop. Okay. Um, okay. That's all I got. Okay. Um, I do remember Norm was in front of us at the last application too, and was fairly, uh, contrite in his <laughs> compliance. Um, so basically, this is just a renewal because he didn't get the work done over COVID, right? Is that what I'm hearing? And he's changed the septic system. We don't know the rationale for that. Uh, no, I don't know the rationale, but you are correct. Um, it's not necessarily a true renewal because the permit has expired. So it's a new permit, but it represents a renewal of the okay. expired uh, just for clarity. Um, we don't know why he's chosen to put in a separate system and not connect it to the existing system, but that is a change that was outlined. And, and just quickly, the landowner uh, was uh, would have liked to have attended today, uh, but he had a business meeting and, and was unable to attend. Okay. Any other questions, Kevin? Yeah, Paul mentioned about whether or not it was a condition in the previous approval, and I clicked a few pages and found it, and it was identical to number 10 and 11 in this one as well. So the conditions were there, but Norm chose not to see them, or didn't see them. Paul Clark? Uh, my experience is uh, why he might want to build a, a separate system is that uh, uh, some of these uh, septic systems just don't do not um, work if you're uh, uh, if you haven't planned them in the first place. So I had, for instance, I had a septic system that required a septic pump to pump up to the field. And uh, for for instance, if he didn't want to do something like that, then uh, then he would build his own smaller, another smaller probably system. Um, so I can understand the rationale for that. Yeah. Uh, maybe that just the topography or something doesn't work for him. Well, okay. sep septic systems are not cheap, and putting in a septic system for a toilet and a sink that would only see occasional use, not like someone was living there, um, seems to be quite expensive, but that is not my concern about the cost. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought of that too. Yeah. Kevin and Paul, your hands are still up. Anything more? Oh, sorry. No. <clears throat> no, I'll move approval of staff recommendation. Okay. Paul Clark? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Paul Ryan? Sure. And I'll say yes too. Okay, moving on to application VA3. So Jan, before you start this, um, maybe talk to the rest of the group, but I had a discussion with you offline that maybe we could change renewals of B&Bs to be more like visitor accommodation where they don't need to come to NPC unless there's issues. You guys can just automatically renew them. Do you want to take that up after we process this? Um, well, it'll require a land use bylaw amendment. So um, what it, because see the land use bylaw doesn't give the development officer specific authority under section 40 two or 43, um, to be able to renew B&Bs. It says that visitor comms and secondary suites can be renewed by the development officer, but it doesn't mention that bed and breakfast can be. 
So okay. this kind of thing would require a land use bylaw amendment. So what we could do um, is have an internal discussion in the planning department. And um, if we think that, you know, this is something that should be handled by the development officers, then we could at the next land use bylaw amendment or review, we could add that. Okay. What the rest do you think about that? I think it's a great idea. Um, um, unless there is a significant change in the uh, uh, request for renewal. We'd probably have to, I don't know if we can make that stipulation that the development officer can do a renewal as long as there's no changes. Maybe we could do that. Um, but we can have a discussion in internally, like I said, on logistics. Well, let's leave it at that and let you guys follow up and have that discussion. Because in my mind, it should be similar to the visitor account. Any other comments? Okay, let's move on to the application then, Jan, when you're ready. All right, thank you. Um, so this application is submitted by the landowners, or the, I mean the tenants of the property, Brandy and Kevin Smith. The landowner, which is a number company, uh, has uh, consented by way of a director letter. The uh, subject property is located in the Hamlet of Dead Man's Flats at 120 Rivers Bend Way. And the application is to renew a two bedroom bed and breakfast operation in the basement area of the existing dwelling. Bed and breakfast uses are listed as discretionary uses um, in the R1 district. So the application has been referred to the MPC for a decision. The applicant tenant was previously issued a development permit number 3120 for a one year bed and breakfast use. Uh, this development permit expired on July 18th, but the application was received prior to the permit expiring. The original dwelling was approved for construction through development permit 67, uh, no, I'm sorry, 62 slash 17. The dwelling is deemed complete and was issued occupancy approval pursuant to the building permit that was issued. The regulations for bed and breakfast uses are contained within section 4.3 of the land use bylaw. And generally the regulations require that a guest registry be kept, that the B&B be operated by the permanent residents, which includes tenants by definition in our bylaw. They are limited to a maximum of two accommodation units or bedrooms and must be operated within the dwelling only and not within a suite on the property. The regulations also outline that no home-based business may be conducted on the property while a B&B is being operated, unless otherwise approved by the MD. When the original bed and breakfast was approved, a wall sign was permitted to be installed. This sign has been installed and a picture has been provided showing the location of the wall sign. This picture would form part of any uh, schedule to any permit issued. The applicants outline that they will serve breakfast to their guests upon request and that they'll prepare the breakfast in their own um, main kitchen in the home. There is no second kitchen um, established or in place uh, for this B&B. &B. The land use bylaw requires that there be an additional two on-site parking stalls provided for the B&B &B operation. The applicant submitted a parking plan and they have showed a picture uh, that outlines there are four stalls on the property, two for the dwelling and two for the B&B &B use. This parking plan will also form a schedule to any permit that might get issued today. The floor plan has been submitted showing the size and the location of the bedrooms for the B&B. &B. These will also form a schedule to any permit issued. The land use re bylaw requires that a statutory declaration be signed evidencing that the operators are the uh, permanent residents of the property. And this declaration has been sworn and it is in your agenda material. 
The land use bylaw also outlines that the approval of a bed and breakfast may only be for a one year period for the first application, but it could be renewed for up to three years thereafter. The applicants are seeking this three year renewal. The land use bylaw also outlines that all discretionary applications include notification to adjacent neighbors. A notification map has been prepared and included in your agenda package showing the properties that were notified by the landowner. Uh, staff are not aware of any complaints uh, with respect to this B&B. &B. Um, and I should have mentioned that no, no responses were received to that notification that was sent out. The staff recommendation is for approval for the renewal for a three year period, subject to the recommendation outlined in, in the report. And that's the end of my background and I can answer any questions. Any complaints? No complaints that we're aware of. Okay, I'll move it then, Mr. Chair. Lynn is muted. I got my camera off because my battery's going low. Sorry. Paul Clark, are you uh, for? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Paul Ryan? Yes. And I too am a yes. Katie, did you get that? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. That's it for the application. So, uh, there's one notice of decision. Any questions or comments about that? I'm going to think that's a no. Uh, no new information, new referrals, new business. Any comments on the councillor minutes? Okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? You're muted, Kevin. Yeah, I move adjournment. Okay. okay, thank you, everybody. Have a great oh, day. we're not done. We have to vote. Oh, damn. Paul Clark? <laughs> Paul? Yeah, yeah. Enthusiasm. Probably got, he's going to take his boat out somewhere today. No, my, my battery is blinking red here. I'm about to crash. Okay, we'll go fast. Kevin? Yes. Paul? Yes. Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Meeting is important. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.